Hello, must readers. I'm Erin Papelka. I am the founder of Must Read Fiction, a place for people who know that life is better with a novel in hand. And I am so delighted to be here today with Olomide Popula. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's truly my pleasure. Olumide Popula is a London-based Nigerian-German writer, speaker, and performer. She has published a novella, a play, a short story collection, and her first novel is When We Speak of Nothing, which is this beautiful novel I have here in my hands. Um, and she also holds a PhD in creative writing. So this is just, we have so much good stuff to talk about. You are very, very busy and doing great work in the world. So let's just start right with the very beginning. I love to ask people, when did you first know that you wanted to be a writer? I wanted to be a writer when I started learning to write at age six, which is when you go start school in Germany. And I think it must have been the connection of loving stories and loving to play with your imagination and then figuring out that somebody's actually you know, doing this so that the writing process. So yes, I proclaimed at age six that I was going to be a writer. And that's actually the thing that I've pursued throughout my life. So I never really veered very far from that goal. So. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned, you know, learning to write in Germany, and I know that you mm -hmm. lived internationally. So how did growing up in different countries um, affect your work and your perspective uh, in your writing? I think it's, it's, first of all, access obviously to different sort of worldviews and realities as well. Like I spent a lot of time in Nigeria, spent some years during my childhood in Nigeria, but also traveled back and forth between Germany and Nigeria a lot. So I think it's that is language wise also and language is not just how we express ourselves, but it's also a system of thinking as well. And I think it gives you access to all different ways of approaching things. And later on, I think because I've lived in different countries, I feel almost always more comfortable when I'm outside Germany and Nigeria. So London works very well for me. I lived in Amsterdam before. And I think what it is is this sort of um, insider, outsider view. So you know a lot, but you're not 100% of that place or the other way around. You are of that place, but you're also of another place. And I sort of the in-betweenness that could also be a beyondness. And I think as a writer, that's quite a great position because you're sort of already an observer as a writer and this just adds another layer to it. Absolutely. And I find that fiction is a really great way to sort of get a little bit uncomfortable and kind of see things in a new perspective because yeah. the, the fact that you're picking up a book, you're reading the words of another. And with fiction, the words of another, like a character that's even like separate from the writer. Is, did yeah. you feel that's at play with your international experience as well? Yes, absolutely. Exactly that, I think. Um, uh, it allows me to maybe imagine think things that are sort of no but it's not completely me so that's the process part where with that I'm coming up with as a writer but of course as a writer you're doing the same as the reader you're you're slipping into a character's psyche somebody who's not you you have some connections and you discover some things about yourself but you are actually trying to discover another person yeah and I think that definitely helps coming from different places and traveling a lot it just also influences and ideas and inspiration I mean that's just also one part of it you know I get a lot of ideas Although you can get a lot of ideas just sitting on the bus, if you're very <laughs> sure, <upset. laughs> sure. There's, you know, yes, sixty different ideas walking onto the bus and leaving the bus, and you know, all the different. Yeah, that's sure. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about this wonderful novel when we speak of nothing. So tell me about it. Tell me the story um, a little bit more about the novel. So when we speak of nothing was also my PhD project. So I did a um, practice based PhD and meaning that the, the novel was the biggest part. And then I wrote like a critical part, a theory part to go with it. And I was working in a community center in, in, in the center of London in an area called King's Cross. And there was a lot of young people coming and going. And I was particularly fascinated how the young men were conducting themselves. And they were all very sharp, very cool, very trendy, very urban crowd, but they, I, I really have this sense of a tenderness for them, but I also saw a lot of tenderness in the way they conducted their friendship. And because I'm, I think I was particularly interested in the man because I was a young woman before and I had friendships, but I hadn't seen up close yet with the distance from being older how the guys were doing it. And so I was fascinated. And I think that was the driving factor because the novel is really about a friendship between two 17-year-old boys who become men and um, yeah, and their friendship and loyalty and tests along the way. And I think that was a driving factor. And then a lot of things sort of happened while I was writing that then added to the story. 
Oh, so we yeah. can come back to that. But that's the starting <laughs> point, at least. You know? Sure, sure, sure. So you talk about, you know, the book being about this friendship between mm-hmm. Abu and Carl are two of the main characters. Can you yes. tell me a little bit more about um, those two characters? Yeah, sure. So they're both 17 Black boys in central London. And they have a particular friendship because um, Carl, who's the main character, has some problems at home and often stays with Abu. So, so Abu's family has become this sort of sur- surrogate family. Carl is also a trans man, so they experience a lot of bullying, but they kind of together go through thick and thin. And they basically just have to find a way to negotiate a very hot summer. There's some racial tensions in the city. The London riots are about to, to happen. So things are sort of heating up, actually, like, like it is now, except for we don't have that sort of tension <laughs> blowing up, but it's super hot at the moment. Um, yeah, and it's how they handle it. And... Carl finds a letter from his unknown father. And because he already has a fraught relationship with his mother, he, um, uh, he embarks on a journey to find his father who's in Nigeria. And that puts a big, big test on their friendship because Carl stays in Nigeria much longer than he was supposed to. And Abu is really missing, in his word, his main man and is thinking it's enough now. So yeah, that's sort of the, I think that's, those are sort of the cornerstones of the story. Oh, wonderful. Um, Well, yes, thank you. Thank you for exploring that world. And again, kind of an international story, pieces in London, pieces in Nigeria, um, and also, yes, this teenage relationship. Um, So one of the quotes about the book from Elle magazine said, this smart novel with electric prose tells us what it means to be young, black, and queer in London. And so I think that 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 quote is a kind of great way to just like touch on some of these really big Mm. questions and issues that you deal with in this novel, these questions of race, these questions of sexual identity, and then doing it through the perspective of teenage boys, which is also just a big question in and of itself. So how did you navigate some of these bigger questions as you were writing the novel? So that's, and and that's, lets me come back to what I said earlier. Some things happened while I was writing. So I knew I was going to talk about young, young boys through their voice. So I spent a lot of time trying to uncover what this voice could be like. And I call it sort of, I call it urban speak. So I really try to find a voice that would transport the character. So it is my idea of how they speak or what I've heard, how they speak. That's, that's the first thing. So um, I started out and I knew I was going to go to Nigeria. I wanted to personally, me as the writer, learn about the Niger Delta by going there. So in a way, I created a, um, I, I created a need to go there. So that I had to do research for the novel so I could go there. But then as I was about to embark, the London riots happened. And I, I was working in the center where I knew that some of the young men and the women as well were actually going to sites where there was looting or they were burning down things. So it was almost, I'm writing a novel about the perspective of young people during a particular time. So I couldn't ignore that. So in a way, that's how some of these issues got layered. Initially, if if that hadn't happened, we probably would have just had the journey to Nigeria and Abu would have had a different story in London. So Abu gets entangled in the London riots and um, so we get to see that sort of parallel story of the riots in London, the Niger Delta there. And for the rest, it is more, I think uh, um, there are so many different issues, but it's a matter of perspective because some of them are overlapping. So Carl is trans, he's black, he's also working class or, you know, of the underclass. So in a way, they're not separate. They're inter- intertwined because of just who he is. So in a way, we're dealing with a lot of issues but from one particular perspective. Sure. Sure. And it's not like he can just, unta- it's not like he cannot be black. It's not like he cannot be. Trans. Yes. He cannot you decide know? one day. It's oh, we're not going to talk about this. Right. And the thing about the trans thing is that it's not a novel about being trans. I just sort of weave that in as something. It's just who he is. So rather than exploring that in depth, yes, other novels can do that or firsthand experiences, nonfiction. Um, so it was just this is a character who is all these things and he's navigating in this world and what does that mean when A, B, C, D happens? Sure, absolutely. And I think that's also one of the beautiful things about fiction is that, you know, we're, we are telling the story, but we're telling it through the lens of our characters and our mm-hmm. characters' bodies and their experience and what that feels like. And so, yes, much like we can't untangle all the different pieces of our own identities, we can't do that for our characters either. They're all there. Exactly. Together. 
Yes. And you open the novel with this really wonderful uh, parable, almost um, this story of the, 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 the message seems to be so much of truth depends on where you're standing and how you're looking at it. And so I, I thought that was a really interesting place to open. And especially as we're talking about some of these questions about race and sexual identity. And so it, is that a lesson that we can practice here in the state? Certainly we have some very real, very current questions happening around race and sexuality. And I know in, in London, it's the same thing and so yeah and so tell me a little bit more about you know what you're thinking with that opening with that story and and how that has perhaps grounded you either in the novel or in your own practice Mm -hmm. um certainly i think we can learn from imagining the other perspective a little bit and that will help us sometimes in our maybe forwarding our own understanding of the world and society but the um, story you're referring to is actually it's not from me it's a mythological story of the god Ishu who is a Nigerian god or Yoruba god and is a god of the crossroads and he stands for so many things that are important in the novel and actually you already named it it's Ishu who grounded me in the novel in so many different ways Ishu's a very subtle narrator. So what I mean by subtle is that unless you really know, you might not notice, you might just read the novel as a third person narrative. But the story is a, is a very famous story about issue. And issue stands when issue appears in, in people's lives, so that, that's the understanding. There might be some trickery, some obstacles put in the way that you don't understand why they're happening at that particular time. They seem almost like nonsense, just trickery for trickery sense. But through growing through these obstacles, we arrive at a new understanding of ourselves and the world around us. So in a way, it's offering us um, the opportunity for growth. So I wanted to start with that, and I end with that. So in the end, there's a very clear message from, from Issue. I'm not going to give that away because... You have to read the yes, novel. Read the, read the book. No spoilers. <laughs> Check it out. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's how that came about, and it it grounded a lot of the things that are going on for mm-hmm. me because the issue, is, yeah, that famous story is about friends who all of a sudden crawl out of nowhere. But the issue is also concerned with language. I think the novel is quite voice driven. Um, he's concerned also with things like andro- being androgynous shape-shifting so it, it fitted in some of the things the themes that I explore around gender uh, as well yeah that's that is how it came about and that's yeah. the for me yeah oh absolutely and, and it was it's a great place to start because it it does if we're talking about fiction getting a, a little uncomfortable a little unbalanced you know just opening with that story you're like mm-hmm. oh which which side am I? How am I seeing this? And how is that mm-hmm. going to affect what's going to come next? And how am I carrying myself into my ex- in, into my experience of this novel too? So it's a a fantastic place to start. It's really lovely to hear that actually because I don't hear a lot of th- people talk about that opening section unless they already know about issue and then then. But to hear that it actually did that. So how would I? position myself. It's really great to hear. Thanks for that. That's oh, well, th- thank you for a fantastic opening. Absolutely. And so you talked about the language of the book mm-hmm. and um, it is a really lyrical book. It's very rhythmic in terms of the language. And you are also a poet and performer and playwright as well as a speaker. And so I just wanted to, you know, kind of talk about like the language and the rhythm and some of those other hats that you've worn along the way and continue to wear. And how, how did some of those other disciplines work their way into to the novel. Yeah, I think I just obviously being very voice driven and something that you could read out in a very dramatic form comes from being a performer. And I think I sort of, I still have this need to have very, very distinct voice that I love reading out. I sort of, and I think that's definitely my starting point. Um, it was a bit hard, I have to say. I, I created that voice and then I finally had the first chapter and I found it very, very hard to get to the second chapter because it was so distinct and I hadn't yet really embodied it. So it took quite a while between first and second chapter and then it started sort of rolling. So the same thing with being a poet. I think I'm always concerned with the hearing and the rhythm and the melody much more than just the plot itself. So I... I wonder if I can, I mean, I, I probably could, but I'm not so driven to write a very plot-based um, novel that is just about the action. It sort of always has to, has to really sound right. And the repetition or not repetition or short sentences, just, yeah, that's um, something that definitely comes from doing poetry for a long time before I started doing fiction. Fantastic. And so um, my question next is sort of like, so you're, you know, this project is, is a novel, um, mm-hmm. but how do you know what form your creativity will take having worn so many different hats along the way? 
I think I really like the novel form now. So I don't really do poetry these days. And it, basically, I couldn't find the next stage in poetry for, for me. And then I started writing play, a play. And I've sort of found fiction and long fiction, I think. So I do write short stories as well. I think for a while now it might just, I definitely, it's going to be novels for a while. I definitely the next project is a novel. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen afterwards because novels take so long, go through all, <laughs> all the different um, uh, stages. But yeah, I like the long form. It's interesting to me because the other things can happen um, and there's so many layers. So there's so much growth also as, as a writer in that. And also, as you just said, actually, I can use all these other tools that I have in there as well. I can be poetic. And when I, you know, when I read, that's my performance bit. So I sort of get the whole package in what, you know, it's, it's a package true. deal in a way. It's true. Yes, absolutely. And I imagine, yes, reading the novel out loud. Yes, because then you get to enjoy the, the rhythm of the poetry yeah. of the language and all of those pieces and then do it in person, which is a fantastic thing. So It's fun. It's fun. Yeah. That's great. And so you also teach creative writing. Um, and so I just wanted to touch on that. Are there lessons that you've learned from your students as you've been teaching writing? All the time. All the time. And that's why I love it so much, because it's such a circular process. And first of all, just inspiration, especially, you know, people are coming very frustrated what they do with writing. And there's always something I think, oh, great. And so they're having those completely different approaches, but also having to talk about writing and having to break it down and to, to say why I think something works particularly well. So when we're looking at excerpts of, you know, published writers, um, the explaining aspects of dialogue or description, etc., point of view. And each time I find something new in there as well, because I have to look at it differently. And so all the things they go through, I also go through. I know the theory of it, but again, we're talking about it again. And then some of the questions might bring me to a new, you know, to new understanding of something. So that's why I love it so much. So it's inspirational for that reason. And I love the workshop, the creative writing workshop. It's just a fantastic um, place where a lot of good things can happen. Wonderful. And are there lessons that you hope that your students learn from you or advice you hope they keep along the way? Yes, experiment and to be free and to have confidence and a little bit of trust that things will come. So this is, yeah, I think when you start out writing this idea that it has to be there very quickly, is there? When I, think, I always say writing is rewriting. So to really be completely free and trust that maybe it's not there, but by the 10th draft, it might be there. And so sorry if you thought the first draft is fine. Usually it takes a little bit longer. Right. So yeah, I hope that. And yeah, the joyfulness, a playfulness. I would hope they take a playfulness away. Yes. Oh, well, that is beautiful lessons, I think, to end on for our conversation, thinking about playfulness and joy and trusting the process. Um, Olamide Populo, thank you so much for this wonderful book, When We Speak of Nothing. Thank you for talking to me about it. And yes, keep up the fantastic writing and the fantastic work. Thank you so much for having me and those great questions.